we have heard um, six very outstanding speakers uh, in their earlier sessions, each sharing with us very different perspective uh, from uh, the, the fact that we need a good AI talent right through to um, a user adoption journey as well as great expectations. Um, now in this panel, uh, we're going to talk about how AI uh, will impact an organization and more importantly, the readiness of an organization. Uh, before I hand you over to the moderator who will then lead this discussion, I'd like to take this opportunity to make an announcement uh, which will be uh, very relevant. Um, this morning, uh, the APARA, the Asia Pacific Assistive Robotics Association had the benefit of a very good discussion with the Asian Robotics Review, right? a publication that, that reached out to close to 100,000 subscribers on its um, uh, e-magazine. Uh, this magazine goes out on a weekly basis. Uh, today, we have inked a partnership for APARA to be part of uh, their uh, publication and will be part of their content on a weekly basis. So a lot of success stories that we are going to hear uh, in Airbotics 2021 as well as some of the stories in 2020 will now be included into the Asian Robotic uh, Review. This will start next month and for any further information, please feel free to check out our website at apara.asia. So with that, um, I guess uh, we have already introduced uh, Mr. Ku Sing Ming, the Senior Deputy Director of AI Singapore and uh, I'd like him to take over to, to introduce his panel members and lead this uh, panel discussion. Seming, over to you. Thank you, Oliver. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this panel session. And uh, this panel session, we'll be talking about how we are ensuring the readiness and the impact of air deployment within the organization. Uh, we have assembled a panel uh, from Malaysia, Singapore, and as well, Hong Kong as well. So we have Dr. Chua uh, from uh, Head of Smart, Factory uh, SHRDC from Malaysia. And in Singapore, we have Mr. Kuping Xiong, uh, Dr. Tan Ji Singh, as well as Mr. William Ng. And then uh, in from Hong Kong, uh, we have uh, Professor Xiao King Ling, uh, which is from City University of Hong Kong. So uh, before we start, when it comes to discussing the question, I'll just like to invite the panelists to all self-introduce yourself to those who have not caught you earlier in your session. So I'd like to go in this sequence. Can I invite Dr. Chua first, followed by Mr. Ku Ping Xiong, uh, Dr. Tan, uh, Mr. William Ng, and then last but not least, uh, Professor King. So Dr. Chua, if you could do a one minute introduction of yourself. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sing Ming. Uh, a very good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Dr. Chua, and I'm currently the head of Malaysian Smart Factory. 4.0 under the Salango Human Resource Development Center. So uh, we support the industries and the communities, um, you know, to, to actually move towards digital transformation in a more sustainable manner. And uh, we focus a lot on a people-focused strategy to achieve that. So that's um, in brief what we uh, do at the Malaysian Smart Factory at SHRDC. Mr. Ku, please. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so yeah, you can call me Ku. Um, I'm the president for AI Professionals uh, Association. So uh, at AI Professional Association, AIP in short, what we do is we uh, level up talents, uh, passionate talents, and also help organizations to adopt uh, AI uh, ethically, efficiently, and effectively. Yeah. Dr. Tan, if you could. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Tan Jit Singh. I'm actually a medical doctor and I'm still actively practicing. I'm very interested in uh, using technology as a whole in the healthcare field. And I'm also currently the vice president of APARA. And one of our first program is AI Biotics uh, 2021. Um, hopefully I can learn from uh, the other panelists here on all the AI application and see which uh, application may be suitable in the healthcare uh, field. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. William, please. Hello, everyone. My name is William here. I'm the Chief Operations of Officer of uh, UPASO. Uh, we are actually an uh, AI-enabled uh, same-day delivery platform uh, that conducts uh, delivery uh, from point to point or on the same day or faster uh, uh, services. Thank you. Thank you, William. And last but not least, Professor King. 
Hey, hi, everybody. So my name is uh, Ken Xiao. In Singapore, they call me Xiao Ken. Uh, I use uh, Ken Xiao in the US so that they are not confused about my last name. So I'm a Singaporean. Uh, I uh, study for my uh, master's and went over to uh, Canada for my PhD. Worked for the last five years in US. I just came here uh, in the information system at the City University of Hong Kong uh, since June. So, so everybody. Thank you. Thank you, our panelists. So let's start with uh, a question, right? Uh, so we are all talking about AI deployment and all that. So how do we know we are ready for an AI project? And uh, how, how can you describe actually a readiness scenario? Uh, perhaps I'd like to invite uh, William, since you just recently went through a part of a project, would you like to just give a comment uh, on this? Thank you. Okay, so I believe that everyone has heard uh, Singing talk about the uh, rare AI readiness index, and uh, I will urge that you know to use that as a guide uh, uh, to, and you have to be at least in the AI uh, aware stage uh, to really know uh, what would be the business value. Like uh, uh, Ping Swan also mentioned earlier that uh, business case and the business value is the first point uh, you want to, to identify. And then subsequently, after you build up the business case uh, for the AI, is to communicate to the organization and also uh, the management to, to get the right uh, resources to be able to commit uh, for the AI project. And uh, one of the most important thing I see often lacking in enterprises uh, that want to uh, look at AI uh, deployment of projects is actually also the data. So uh, a lot of them don't really collect data on an ongoing basis. And uh, even if they have, uh, some of them are, are, are rather um, you know, dirty or messy and, and can't really be, be used without mm. the proper labeling. So they, they, they will require quite a bit of effort to categorize uh, this data. Uh, coming to an analogy example, uh, we have a user uh, uh, they want to look at uh, uh, deploying you know, AI in their project. They, they are actually a fairly large uh, company with about 20 uh, vehicles uh, delivering their goods in-house uh, before we, we help them to do the delivery. So the, the deliveries are being passed to the drivers by the warehouse team daily, but there are no really records of the, the routes that the drivers take, how much time they take to complete delivery and the time that you know these packages were being delivered. Uh, uh, it's simply based on the, the experience uh, uh, of the, the drivers. And uh, by doing so, you can't really, you know, uh, use the, the uh, uh, any kind of experience uh, to then teach the machine in order to optimize the routes. Mm. And, and uh, it will be difficult for, for companies like, like such to, to embark on an AI project. Yeah, actually, I agree with you on, on, on many areas. Uh, in fact, uh, there has been a lot of emphasis when it comes to machine learning engineering and all that. But, uh, those who have done AI projects know that 90% of the time or even more than that is just done preparing the data. And data wrangling is, is such an important thing before you ever start running the model, which today, because of GPU and powerful compute, doesn't take that long. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, William. Let's uh, So from an AI user perspective, let us take a look at this from an uh, uh, ecosystem perspective or a grassroots one. Maybe I'd like to invite Dr. Chua. Uh, from your perspective in head of smart nation, uh, smart factory in Malaysia, or that, how do you actually see this question? How, how do you know whether organization is ready for projects? Yeah. Yep. So um, at, at the Malaysian smart factory, we, we um, really work together with the industries and the associations to really understand how ready are industries um, to adopt not just AI, but also digital adoption. Right, and and we see that a lot of um a lot of uh, constraints are where the um you know business owners or even the top level management um they they may not have a very strong understanding of how technology and even AI will actually impact the organization, and uh, just like what Mr. William has mentioned as well, uh, a lot of organizations do not have a lot of data at hand, right? So so in, in this way, what we actually see is um you know industries. Um, they, they want to go towards AI adoption, but they don't have the um, right strategies when it comes to data collection, uh, data wrangling, processing, visualization, and many, many others. So, so we start to see that there's a lot of adoption now starting up at the um, data collection portion, right? Because we sort of break it down into bite-sized level for them to see how they can achieve AI through a level-based concept in Malaysia. So we start from level one, which is data collection. Then we go visualization, storage, um, you know, formulation, analytics, and then go to AI. So, so as it's slowly moving and progressing, but um, this is how we see that number one is the cultural acceptance, 
right? That technology will actually help them to go forward. The next thing is actually the gather of data um, in the organization to help them visualize what is the impact that AI can do for them. Mm. Thanks, Dr. Chua. I think you brought up a very, very good good point. You talk about management, you also talk about culture. So, so as we described early in the AI readiness index also, there's also organization readiness from uh from, from the staff perspective and the user perspective. So perhaps let's look at um how can actually human worker prevent uh, pre prepare themselves to coexist. With, with the AI solution. I mean, it's good that now AI is broadly demystified through quite a number of channels. AI Singapore is AI for everyone. And there's also similar uh, AI 101 courses or that. Uh, William, Mr. William, maybe you can share because you've recently done the project yourself. So how did the UPASSER folks after taking on the, the new AI model, how did they prepare themselves for this uh, increased productivity? Yeah. Nah, okay. Actually, first uh, is to recognize that uh, the AI solutions are tools to help them complete the, the job faster and, and easier. So uh, the AI solutions cannot really do their work uh, without uh, uh, you know, human assistance and AI solutions uh, 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 are there to really help humans uh, really complement their, their work. So in our example of what we have, we have done with uh, AI SG, right, uh, in the clustering of jobs allow the drivers to actually spend less time thinking about what are the jobs uh, uh, that are most suitable for them. Imagine having to scroll through like a few hundred uh, options and then try to decide uh, uh, which are the deliveries that are most suitable for you. Uh, takes up a lot of time and drivers are, are you know, uh, distracted on the road and it, it, it actually uh, improves their safety uh, with this clustering. So with, with a smart bundling, the drivers accept the, the jobs in bundles and uh, could actually help them to improve their, their productivity and spend less time deciding what kind of jobs they need to do. Uh, but one point I will definitely need to uh, caution is to allow human feedback uh, into the models. And don't just only take uh, uh, what the models uh, prescribe. Uh, for, for example, there was a, a time uh, that we have a very low acceptance uh, for the machine clustered uh, jobs. So, so we, we set out uh, to really understand why uh, by doing interviews with the drivers and then comparing uh, 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 the models uh, with the train models. And we realized that it was because that uh, it was during uh, Ramadan, which is the holy month for our Muslim brother. And then they actually avoided uh, products uh, like pork or alcoholic uh, uh, the type of deliveries. And, and uh, if you cluster them together, then somehow they will take it. Then they will, they will try to reject uh, such jobs. Although it's uh, it's efficient route for them uh, because of the the religious uh, practices uh, uh, it's not the right one for them. So so we we are, we have to take in this type of, of model uh, uh, to really uh, understand uh, how to really improve model based on the driver's feedback. Otherwise, right, you, we might we might you know even witness this type of driver protests and what we have for uh, uh, <laughs> Amazon drivers, right? Uh, they are being forced to to do the the jobs uh, uh, that the AI uh, uh, prescribed them to do. But they can't complete the deliveries. The drivers think it's impossible to, to complete, and they yeah. go out and think that you know it's just trying to force them to, to do more. Yeah, mm. totally agree. I, I think human in the loop. That that's the, at the at the end of the day, AI is a tool, and it's more of a tool to help us, not a tool to replace us. You see, I actually have a very uh, interesting story to share, and this one I heard it before when uh, back then when I was still doing industry development in IDA, and that was Changi Airport was then rolling out automated uh floor cleaner and they only operated at night midnight where the traffic was low for some reason the company deploying it cannot understand why the robot is getting spoiled and one day they realized that actually the night cleaners right, were deliberately <laughs> beating on the machine itself thinking that it's actually killing their jobs you see but well that is something i think we need to address uh, which points up to a point there will be things like this where there are red flags uh, you can have everything aligned, organization readiness, data readiness, infrastructure readiness. Knowing that we are human, there's also human factors. There will be some red flags. Uh, so what kind of red flags beside this uh, when we observe or we are able to observe before that? Actually, it may not be the right time for AI deployment. I think at this point, maybe I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Kukun Xiong. Uh, perhaps from your experience dealing with the ecosystem or that, if there are some stories that you may be able to share on this. Oh, uh, okay. So, so in terms of reflex, right? Um, actually, actually, if you ask me, 
uh, when it comes to adoption of AI, right, technology has never been the 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 key roadblock. The key roadblock has always been humans and uh, humans and cultures, uh, mm. and, and stuff like that. So so that that would be I think the key the key thing over here. Um, so expectation, uh, I think setting the right expectation on the projects, what kind of value you're going to get from the projects, uh, is important. Uh, if this one is not met, I will say that's a red flag. Um, the second one will be data. Um, I keep on hearing people say that, hey, I got data means I can do AI, mm. but that's not true because you have to dig into the data first and see whether the quality, the granularity, the timeliness and all these, right, whether it, it meets the, the business question or not. Uh, what I call, this is what I call a data problem fit, whether the data can answer the problem or not. If the data cannot answer the problem, you got a lot of data also doesn't really, doesn't help at all. Uh, a, a common analogy I give to people, right, is you go and see doctor, right, but you tell the doctor the symptoms of other people rather than yourself. And then you ask the doctor for your diagnosis. Yeah, good point. Mm. yeah so yeah, so you're, you're doing it um, not, not correctly. Now, another point, actually, I wanted to stress over here since there's an opportunity, right, is I think a lot of us overlook the part about implementation. Yes, you can generate the machine, the best machine learning models and all this, right? But if it doesn't fit into the business process, the customer service process and all this, right? It still fail. Uh, it still fail. So actually the implementation strategy is also very important as well, but it's often overlooked uh, mm. in, in, in a lot of training programs and also talks as well. And I mm. thought this would be a good opportunity to share this, yeah. Mm, true. Thanks for sharing, Mr. Ku. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tan, uh, what about what about your perspective, especially yeah. in healthcare? Right? What, what are the one or two red flags that, yeah, maybe it's really not the right time for AI deployment? Yeah. I think for healthcare per se, there are lots of red flags. Actually, everywhere is a red flag. I, I would say that because uh, healthcare is very non-linear, you know, in terms of the way that we make decisions sometimes. So, uh, and we actually have, must have a clear understanding of how the AI work. It cannot be a black box AI that, you know, we give you information, you tune out a result. We must know mm -hmm. how the AI comes to the result. So in that sense, right, it is uh, uh, somewhat limited than the, the, the other industry. And also, you know, we need to have a lot of, uh, key ethical principle, uh, for example, protecting autonomy. Can you protect the autonomy? You know, the, the confidentiality will be very important. Um, promote human welfare safety. So, you know, if the AI makes a mistake and cause the doctor to make a mistake, then uh, who is going to be responsible? You know, and can they mm -hmm. ensure the transparency? Like I said, uh, no black boxing, you know, and the responsibility, accountability side and the inclusiveness also. So a lot of times the data we take may have bias, you know, uh, historical bias, you know, sampling bias. So it's quite difficult sometimes that the set of data that we can get now can be all inclusive, unfortunately, for everywhere. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, uh, the person that's looking at using AI must know a thing about two of the AI technology. That is actually the most difficult part. In fact, some of the colleagues I talk to sometimes really uh, uh, don't understand what is AI or, or even even simpler technology. It is quite shocking sometimes to talk to some of my colleagues. I mean, they are true in focusing on their specialty. You know, they know a lot about the disease, the symptoms, but other than that, they may not be so well informed. So it's quite a lot of red flag dealing with the people alone. Making them securing the data is a challenge also sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I can see there's lots of red flags in the healthcare system. Mm, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Tan. Let me try, let me invite uh, Professor King to, to share his perspective. Professor King, you, you have been on different continents. I think it's, it's very useful for, for, for you to share with the audience and the panelists, right? When, when it comes to advice that you're giving, uh, let's look at uh, advices that you're giving to, to very specific scenarios happening in US, and in, and, and in Hong Kong and maybe even other areas that you have been operating in. Uh, what advice would you actually give to them uh, planning to deploy AI projects? And and of course, you can also talk about maybe there are certain red flags that, that you actually see over there that hasn't been covered uh, by the earlier comment. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. 
So, uh, so I guess uh, maybe as a, as an overview. So I guess uh, as some of the earlier panelists mentioned, you have to understand your business, what you're doing. You have to understand your organization, your staff. Are they ready? Uh, are, are they trained? And then you have to understand what's the role of AI. Do you need AI in the first place? You may not need AI, right? And uh, okay, your business. Uh, what's the role of AI or IT in your business? Are they playing a strategic role? You don't have it. You are not at the forefront. You may uh, you may collapse uh, in the next uh, decade or so. Or it's just playing a supporting role, right? A backroom uh, kind of uh, operation. Then you may not have to invest that much money to be the front runner. You can just mm -hmm. be a follower. Let people try out first. When they are successful, then you follow. Right. So depending on uh, what is the role of AI in your company, okay, uh, is it strategic? Is it uh, just a supporting role? Very important. Right. You are strategic. You have to invest money. You have to be in the forefront. Okay. If you're not strategic, then well, just 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 follow. Just uh, let people try it out first. Then you adopt the uh, mature technology. And of course, uh, when you come to that, you have to look at the operational readiness. And do you have the money to invest in AI? You may not have the money. <laughs> if you don't have the money, why you want to invest in AI? Okay, uh, remember last time uh, when we have the uh, ERP and SAP stuff, uh, some of the company, they are middle-sized, they jump into SAP, or you have to buy the software, you have to uh, employ the consultants, and then after that, they went bankrupt. They have no money to pay them. Mm -hmm. right? So if you are not financially uh, strong enough, don't do it, right? unless it's really uh, uh, important to you. Then you have to think of a way to uh, manage the problem. Now, regarding the staff, are, are your staff ready to adopt AI? Are they ready to uh, live with AI, uh, complement and supplement AI? They may not be. Okay, like you say, uh, the night shift uh, people in the uh, Changi Airport, they just hate the robots. <laughs> They'll be kicking robots every day, right? Yeah, so hoping the robot would uh, just collapse and uh, just uh, uh, fail to work, and then their mm. job will not be replaced. Yeah. So it's very important. Right, uh, we did. We are currently running a study. We collected some uh, data from a CEO and a presidents uh, from a major companies in the US and UK. So we asked them, when would you want to develop uh, AI? Uh, what are the ethical issues uh, in what, involved in AI implementation? Or when are you ready to implement AI? So some of them are, I would say, probably pretty unrealistic. Unless I can trust the AI 100%, I'm not going to do it. How are you going to trust the AI 100%? Okay, uh, I, I don't even trust anybody 100%. <laughs> How can you trust the AI 100%? Mm -hmm. right? And then uh, they say, oh, unless uh, all my uh, staff are ready 100%, I'm not going to do it. Your staff will never be ready un unless you actually uh, do it. There will be an exploration stage where people will try and error. Yeah, there will be some investment uh, money that will be wasted. Well, that's, uh, that's expected. So I think a lot of things we need to look into that. And uh, you mentioned about different continent and different uh, security red flags. Uh, those people who like to do a lot of those medical kind of research, mm -hmm. in the US, almost impossible. Because the data, they say, okay, we cannot give you data on this because it's security, privacy, mm -hmm. regulation. You have to remove this, you have to remove that. And once you remove all the items, like this data is useless now. Okay, It's not related to any person or any uh, age group or any gender. How am I gonna, how am I gonna learn anything? Right, I just see some numbers. I don't, I'm not going to understand anything. And at the beginning, uh, people were trying to get data from uh, China. China was much, much more relaxed at that point in time in terms of medical data. So people can get data from China. That's why a lot of people are running to China to do research. And uh, the China AI, AI is also competing with US because they have lots of data. Uh, China is also closing up. Okay, so I'm in Hong Kong. So my, my faculty will say, I have to go to uh, China to, to work on the data. I say, why? Uh, because they don't allow me to use the data when I'm in Hong Kong. I cannot use the data when I'm in China. Yeah, so they have to actually be in China to use the data. Right, so that's also an issue. Right, the, the availability of data. You use machine learning, you know data, how your machine is going to learn unless you are going to adopt the alpha go zero strategy where they just give them a constraint and they learn by itself. But a lot of things in the real world, there's no constraint. <laughs> you cannot define the constraint 100%, so we cannot do that. Yeah, so that's my perspective. I think this it's a lot of interesting area. Uh, we have to uh, look at the uh, readiness of the organization in terms of a few a few issues, right? Yeah, and then uh, make sure that uh, if they jump into it, they are ready to do that financially, operationally, skill set wise, etc. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Kim. 
uh, that is a very very nice concluding statement when, when it comes to all the things that have been shared with all the panelists here I thank you everybody here and uh, to the audience please give some response thank you everybody uh, for listening to this panel session and back to you organizer Yes, thank you so much, um, Mr. Ku Seng Ming, for moderating this session, and thanks to all the uh, panel members for their very insightful comments and suggestions. I, I hope the audience have taken back uh, a very good lesson. In fact, today has been a very interesting day with a, a, a whole host of very enriching content and uh, very good discussions. So uh, we've come, come to the end of this um, webinar. Right, with great thanks to all speakers and panel members. Um, we now will look at uh, possibly welcoming you back again uh, next Thursday. Now, next Thursday, uh, we'll have a very interesting theme. Uh, in fact, uh, just to give uh, the audience a little prelude, we will be talking about intelligent transformation. Hmm. Right. Now, we all have heard about business transformation, digital transformation, right and and on and on but what about the fact that when we start to integrate ai into the transformation process what are the considerations what is going to be different and uh, how can we use and leverage ai uh, as well as robotic technology to accelerate the transformation journey for an organization we will have the privilege of uh, Professor Alex Sell from NUS School Computing as the keynote speaker uh, and a host of other speakers from uh, Asia uh, as well as our colleagues from um, from Europe who's going to wake up early right, early in the morning uh, at 6 and 7 to share with us their experience so do join us again next week next Thursday 